Report. Good evening, welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. We begin with the fallout, the veritable S storm, if you will, over President Trump's comments about immigrants from what lawmakers in the meeting say the president called S hole countries. Reaction has been swift, sharp, and almost overwhelmingly negative. The president engaged in some Twitter damage control this morning, tweeting a vague denial, but Democrats and Republicans who were in that meeting are now weighing in with what they did or did not hear. All of this as a government funding DACA border security deal could now be much tougher to get before next Friday's deadline. Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts starts us off tonight from the North Lawn. Good evening, John. Greg, good evening to you. As we reported last night, multiple sources inside and outside the White House confirmed to Fox News that President Trump did indeed use the language in question in an Oval Office discussion on DACA yesterday afternoon. And as happened so many times in the past, the president and not the issue has now become the story. At a White House event signing a proclamation for Martin Luther King Day, President Trump ignored shouted questions from the press about his comments yesterday. Mr. President, will you give an apology for the statement yesterday? Mr. President, did you refer to African Asians? It was during a heated Oval Office meeting that President Trump reportedly asked, quote, why are we having all these people from S-hole countries come here? A firestorm of controversy erupted across the globe from the Deputy Secretary General of the African National Congress. Ours is not a sole country, neither is Haiti or any other country in distress. To the UN High Commission for Human Rights. These are shocking and shameful comments from the President of the United States. I'm sorry, but there's no other word one can use but racist. Waking up to a world of hurt this morning, President Trump denied he said it, tweeting, quote, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. A short time later, he appeared to walk that back just a bit, tweeting, quote, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is, obviously, a very poor and troubled country. But Democratic Senator Dick Durbin, who was present at the meeting, insisted the president did use those words. It said Haitians. Do we need more Haitians? And then he went on and we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments, calling the nations they come from holes. The exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. House Speaker Paul Ryan, the son of Irish immigrants, wasn't at the meeting, but again found himself weighing in on President Trump's comments. Yeah, I, I read those comments later last night. Uh, so first thing that came to my mind was very unfortunate, um, unhelpful. I see this as a thing to celebrate, uh, and I think it's a big part of our strength. Um, whether you're coming from Haiti, we've got great friends from Africa in Janesville uh, who are doctors who are just incredible citizens. This afternoon, two of the participants at the meeting, Senators Tom Cotton and David Perdue, said, wait a minute, we didn't hear the president say that. In a joint statement insisting, quote, we do not recall the president saying these comments specifically, but what he did call out was the imbalance in our current immigration system, which does not protect American workers and our national interest. In the bigger picture, the president and Congress still seem miles apart on what to do about DACA. The president tweeting that the so-called bipartisan DACA deal presented yesterday was a big step backwards. Wall was not properly funded. Chain and lottery were made worse. And USA would be forced to take large numbers of people from high crime countries, which are doing badly. Earlier this week, President Trump appeared to earn a tremendous amount of political capital and goodwill with that televised hour-long meeting with members of Congress here at the White House. What remains to be seen as negotiations over DACA go forward is how much of that goodwill did the president squander with his comments and how much leverage has he lost in these negotiations? Brett? John, the president also tweeting uh, this morning, defending his decision not to go to Great Britain, uh, quote, reason I canceled my trip to London is that I am not a big fan of the Obama administration having sold perhaps the best located and finest embassy in London for peanuts, only to build a new one in an off location for $1.2 billion. Bad deal, wanted me to cut ribbon, no. 
What about this? Uh, well, the White House say that the president was invited over there to cut the ribbon on the new U.S. embassy, which cost $1.2 billion. Uh, travel was on hold for the end of February, though it was never really firmed up. But I'm told that the president just didn't want to be associated with what he saw as a really terrible real estate deal, that they overpaid for the land. It's in a bad location. And because the standing uh, American embassy has been designated a heritage site, uh, they couldn't get a whole lot of money for it. The president, in that tweet this morning, did make one factual error. Era, though uh, he blamed the embassy deal on the Obama administration, it was actually the Bush administration that initiated the move, and it's resulted in some interesting politics in the UK. London Mayor Sadiq Khan coming out to say that President Trump finally got the message that people in London don't want to see him, which resulted in the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson calling Khan a puffed-up, pompous popinjay. And we should also point out, Brett, that this has got uh, no effect on plans for a state visit of the president to the U.K. later on this year. Congrats on hitting the peas there. That was good. <laughs> John, thank you. thank you. As John just referenced, lawmakers are still trying to cobble together a plan to address immigration reform before another threatened government shutdown next Friday. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel tells us where we are right now. The primary emphasis of immigration talks right now is a bipartisan group featuring key leaders from both chambers of Congress. From the House, it's Kevin McCarthy and Steny Hoyer. From the Senate, it's John Cornyn and Dick Durbin. And House Speaker Paul Ryan endorsed their effort. The four of them have started bipartisan talks trying to aggregate all the ideas that are out there to come to a consensus. Do we need to fix DACA? Yes, we need to fix DACA. Um, but I think it's really important we fix it in such a balanced way. The White House and conservatives rejected the bipartisan proposal from six senators yesterday. Durbin, who is part of those talks as well, said today he isn't giving up on that plan. We are going to prepare our bipartisan agreement for introduction into the Senate next week. If the Republican leadership has a better alternative, bring it forward. If they don't, for goodness sakes, give us a vote. While the talks continue, other Republicans say it's critical to get at some of the core aspects of the nation's immigration problem. Chain migration is clearly important. Again, border security, taking care of the kids with DACA, all of those are important. You want to avoid getting the deal too comprehensive because then there's too much to oppose. But if you can stay laser focused on the four pillars, if you will, then you can actually come to common ground. This debate comes as the government's due to run out of money one week from tonight with Democrats pushing for a DACA deal and more money for domestic priorities. The Democrats need to stop playing politics with our military. They keep saying we've got to solve DACA before January 19th. They're even just stalling on budget talks over this issue. Today, the speaker signaled there will be another stopgap measure, but insisted there won't be a partial government shutdown. We will have to do something short term because it's too short a notice for the Appropriations Committee to write a longer term bill. So it's, they just like technically wouldn't be able to write it. However, with the week ending in controversy, there are some concerned about distraction and Congress's ability to get things done, facing some critical deadlines ahead. Right? Not in a short time. Mike, thanks. President Trump will not pull the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear deal, at least not right now. The president today once again extending sanctions waivers on the Islamic Republic. Correspondent Rich Edson has the specifics tonight from the State Department. Good evening, Rich. Good evening, Brad. And President Trump says he wants a new approach to Iran, and if not, he will pull the United States from the Iran deal in the next few months. The president uh, wants Congress and European allies to demand of Iran access to all sites that international inspectors may request, also an end or an elimination to the sunset clauses in the Iran nuclear deal, among other concessions. In a statement, the president said, quote, no one should doubt my word. If other nations fail to act during this time, I will terminate our deal with Iran. Those who, for whatever reason, choose not to work with us will be siding with the Iranian regime's nuclear ambitions and against the people of Iran and the peaceful nations of the world. The president says this is the last time he will agree to continue lifting sanctions tied to the nuclear agreement unless he secures those changes. That gives negotiators until about this spring to satisfy the president's demands. Demands. European allies that are also part of the Iran deal, the European Union, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, they say they're still reviewing the president's announcements. They have said the deal is working and that all parties should stick to it. In response to the president, Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, tweeted, quote, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, is not renegotiable. Rather than repeating tired rhetoric, the U.S. must bring itself into full compliance 
just like Iran. Now, the Trump administration also announced sanctions not related to the nuclear agreement on other Iranian activities. The Treasury Department says it is targeting those in Iranian leadership who they say displayed appalling mistreatment to those who were demonstrating in the streets of Iran over the last few weeks, along with those responsible for Iran's ballistic missile program and what they say are Iran's other destabilizing activities. Brett. Added to the congressional to-do list, right. uh, Rich Edson, live at the State Department. Rich, thanks. We have new information tonight about what North Korea may be doing to accelerate its nuclear weapons and missile programs. Correspondent Benjamin Hall tells us the Hermit Kingdom is going underground in a big way. Just days ago, North and South Korean officials sat down for talks, a major step forward in relations between the two nations. But today, a report suggests Kim Jong-un has no intention of curbing his nuclear ambitions, as new satellite imagery shows significant tunneling at the country's only known nuclear test site in Pyongri, suggesting the area in the north is being prepped for a future test. Throughout December, mining carts and hundreds of personnel were consistently present around the West Portal, and there was significant expansion of the soil pile. The report says these activities underscore the rogue regime's efforts to maintain capabilities for future nuclear testing. Kim Jong-un did receive rare praise from another world leader, however, President Putin, who praised his fellow dictator for completing his strategic goals, saying he had, quote, won this round against the West. And now he is interested, of course, in cleaning up the situation, smoothing it, calming it. He is an absolutely shrewd and mature politician. At the moment, there are tenuous hopes for relative peace after the North and South re-established dialogue. But the White House said today U.S. policy towards the rogue regime had not changed. We continue with a maximum pressure campaign on uh, the North Korean dictator. Nor has this stopped the U.S. from deploying three B-2 stealth bombers to the territory of Guam just this week. In another sign that U.S. pressure is working, today China, the North's most important trading partners, announced that trade with North Korea had dropped by 50 percent in December from the same period last year as tighter U.N. sanctions took hold. Brett. Benjamin Hall in London. Benjamin, thank you. More U.S. troops will be going to Afghanistan this spring. Officials tell Fox the Army will deploy roughly 800 additional soldiers in April. That will raise total American involvement inside Afghanistan to about 15,000 troops now. The new forces will specialize in training the Afghan military closer to the front lines. As the war against ISIS winds down in Iraq and Syria, more U.S. jets will also head to Afghanistan, we're told, in coming weeks to provide close air support. Another spectacular day for stocks today. They surged to new record closes in the best start to the year since 2003. The Dow, as you see here, gained 228 today. The S&P 500 was up 19. The Nasdaq jumped 49. Again, all record highs. For the week, the Dow was up two percentage points. The S&P 500 gained one and a half. The Nasdaq surged one and three quarters. The markets are picking up in the new year right where they left off. Let's get some analysis from Deirdre Bolton of Fox Business Network, who joins us from New York. Good evening, Deirdre, and these markets are hot. Good evening, Brett. They sure are. It was a huge markets day. You just gave some of the stats, but all three indices, new records. So the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Financial stocks, these were the standouts, a solid earnings results from J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. Also, big tech played a big role. So you had Apple, Netflix, Amazon, all hitting record highs. Now, strategists say there are numerous reasons for optimism in the market one of which is strong consumer spending. That makes up for two-thirds of U.S. economic power. So if you look to December retail sales, including restaurants, that number rose in December for the fourth straight month. 2017 was the strongest year in three. Shares such as Target, Kohl's, they were standouts for the session, standouts for the week. So auto sales not included in that data, but Fiat Chrysler stock, 52-week high today. The CEO, Sergio Marchionne, announcing that the car company would invest $1 billion in a Michigan plant, pay its non-senior employees $2,000 worth of bonuses, that is to say per employee, and the CEO says these decisions reflect the company's ongoing commitment to manufacturing in the U.S. He also said the company would be hiring about 2,500 American-based jobs. The company is in good company, if you like. It is one of 10 major corporations that have announced employee cash bonuses 
as a result of tax reform. So I went through, I only counted the companies that gave cash bonuses, so not even the ones that gave pay raises or other incentives. By my calculations, back of the envelope, cash bonuses that companies have already paid to American workers so far, three and a half billion dollars. So, Brett, yet another reason for optimism. Back to you. Billion with a B. Wow. Dear Drew, thank you. Up next, how do you feel about merit-based immigration? We'll take a look at it. First, what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 11 in Los Angeles says search crews continue looking for survivors and bodies in the Southern California mudslides. The death toll stands at 17, five people still missing. Fox 46 in Charlotte as Republicans file an emergency appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court to try to preserve North Carolina's congressional map drawn by a GOP legislature. Earlier this week, a three-judge panel struck down the map and ordered a new one be with, uh, redrawn by January 24th. And this is a live look at Tampa from our affiliate, Fox 13. One of the big stories there tonight, Florida lawmakers consider a bill that would limit opioid pain prescriptions to just seven days supply. The law right now is 30 days. Many experts say it would help cut down on opioid addiction, but some doctors and patients with chronic pain, obviously, call it an overreach that could make it tougher on them. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. The president is once again advocating for a merit-based immigration system. So what does that really mean, and how popular or unpopular is it? Correspondent Doug McElway takes a look tonight. I would like to add the words uh, merit into any bill that's submitted. In an earlier time, merit was not a concern for immigrants to the new world. If you were diseased and lice free, there were boundless opportunities. Today, blue collar wages have been dragged down by cheap immigrant labor, while the digital age has put a premium on merit based immigration. Ultimately, I think we should go to a merit based immigration system. If we get every single able bodied American who is not now working or looking for work, you know, and close that skills gap, get them from poverty into the workforce, we're still going to need people in this country. Right. Most advanced nations like Canada, Australia, Germany, even the United Kingdom have immigration policies with some or all of these requirements. An ability to speak the language, a certain level of education, professional licensing, an offer of employment, and an ability to support one's family. The United States doesn't have those standards. Today, you can get a green card in this country simply because someone in your extended family happened to immigrate to this country. There are expensive consequences so to that. The funding that goes into our public schools, the hiring of teachers, the, the, um, the bilingualism that's required, the ESL teachers, that's all a burden of, of this. But politically, merit-based immigration has only the slimmest chance of passage. Democrats are so opposed to ending chain migration, they won't even use the term. This week it emerged that he wanted to change immigration policy with uh, other uh, addressing uh, uh, family unification initiatives, which they call by another name, which I won't use. Divided Senate Republicans who need 60 votes are down to a one-vote majority, and today appeared to lose one when Senator John McCain stated, quote, respect for the God-given dignity of every human being, no matter their race, ethnicity, or other circumstances of their birth, is the essence of American patriotism. Our immigration policy should reflect that truth. Merit-based supporters haven't well, given up hope. We have another year in this Congress. I mean, the, the bottom line is this is a four-year battle. Despite all appearances of bipartisan goodwill from that televised cabinet room meeting earlier this week, the reality is that Democrats are unlikely to budge on merit-based immigration. Brett? Doug, thank you. The fate of illegal immigrants' children brought here at young ages, the so-called dreamers, hangs in the balance with a deadline approaching. Tonight, correspondent Casey Stiegel reports from Dallas about how the uncertainty about their future is affecting the Lone Star State. Yeah, I was born in Mexico. Um, my mom um, brought me here. Norma Salazar is called Texas home since age 10. I know my mom went through a lot, you know, to make this happen for me so I was determined to for it not to be in vain. Salazar went on to graduate high school then paid for her own college education. She now works in a plush Dallas office paying taxes and earning a good wage to help raise her family. But Salazar fears her family's future could now be in jeopardy. If I was to 
be sent to a country that I don't know. Uh, you know, what am I going to tell my children? They will lose their job. Martin Valco is a prominent immigration lawyer. Do you just want to round them up, end the program, and, and remove them? I don't think that's the way to do it. Uh, it, it. They have been here, they've been brought here without their own volition. Those who support ending DACA say it's not that they don't have sympathy, but argue the law is the law. Come in legally and then never leave. Krikorian and other critics also maintain the cost of DACA puts a serious strain on American resources, costing taxpayers billions in education, health care, and other expenditures, and he believes it'll only get worse. Any amnesty creates an incentive for new illegal immigration as people abroad see that somebody else got away with it and they give it a try. Norma Salazar says that's simply not true. If people could see uh, that, you know, we're human, we, we're not criminals, we, you know, we deserve a chance to be here. We, we are Americans. This is our home. The largest impacts would be felt in California and right here in Texas because Pew Research data shows that Dallas Fort Worth has the third highest concentration of DACA enrollees than any other U.S. metro area. Brett? Casey, thank you. Up next, the same Russian hackers who got to the Democrats are now going after the U.S. Senate. First beyond our borders tonight, Saudi women are being allowed to enter a sports stadium to watch a soccer game for the first time, part of reforms instituted by the kingdom's crown prince. This summer, women will be able to legally drive, ending the world's only ban on female drivers. Stocks are higher in Europe on word that German political parties have agreed to coalition talks. Chancellor Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats, the allied Bavaria-only Christian Social Union, and the center-left Social Democrats will continue their partnership. At least three people have been killed in two days of protests and looting in Venezuela. Food shortages have sparked demonstrations there that have also left 16 people injured. The country is in the midst of a deepening economic crisis. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. This is a Fox News alert breaking right now. A House committee has just released statistics showing nearly $300,000 in taxpayer money has been spent to settle 13 claims against members of Congress or their offices since 2003. Those claims include sexual harassment or sexual discrimination. The new statistics add to a running list of settlements released over the last few weeks. They do not include any names or any identifying information aside from settlement amounts and the basis for the claims. America's first female fighter pilot is to fly a combat mission has announced her bid for the U.S. Senate. Arizona Congresswoman Martha McSally joins the field of Republicans running for the seat of retiring Senator Jeff Flake. McSally showed her take no prisoners attitude in her announcement video today. Like our president, I'm tired of PC politicians and their BS excuses. I'm a fighter pilot and I talk like one. That's why I told Washington Republicans to grow a pair of ovaries and get the job done. Also running for flex seat, former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio and former state senator Kelly Ward. The U.S. Senate is said to be in the crosshairs of the same Russian computer criminals who caused chaos for the Democratic National Committee. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge tells us about the next big battle in cyberspace. At the height of the 2016 election, Russia-linked hackers stole and leaked emails via WikiLeaks from the Democratic Party and Clinton campaign. The same hackers, nicknamed Fancy Bear, are now targeting the U.S. Senate. According to new research, hackers are going after lawmakers' network of contacts, as well as compromising information for blackmail. These cyber militia members, uh, who are all Russian-speaking, were attempting to masquerade as Senate websites uh, to essentially trap visitors um, with malware. Security firm Trend Micro found evidence hackers set up fake accounts to mimic the Senate's internal email system. The fancy bear hackers used the same strategy during the French presidential election to steal emails in an effort to influence the outcome. While attribution is difficult, the U.S. intelligence community believes the hackers 
leaders are closely aligned with President Vladimir Putin and Russian military intelligence. A recent Senate report commissioned by Democrats documented their decades-long effort to undermine democracy. The administration is not taking significant enough steps uh, to punish Russia for its interference in our 2016 elections and to prepare us for the 2018 elections. After the election, experts note the fancy bear hackers went quiet. But with no movement on sanctions penalizing Moscow, the hackers got busy. The cyber report predicts that rogue political campaigns are not likely to go away in the near future, with the Olympics and major elections taking place in 2018. These influence operations are seen as low cost and relatively effective. Brett? Kevin, thank you. In tonight's Whatever Happened to series piece, California's High Speed Rail Project. Many people consider it a white elephant, kept alive only by Governor Jerry Brown's commitment to big labor and his legacy. National correspondent William Lajeunesse tells us as of now, there is very little light at the end of this tunnel. Over budget and behind schedule, California's high speed rail project is running out of money. It's not that expensive. We can afford it. In fact, we cannot not afford it. Voters were told nine years ago the train would cost $33 billion. Today, estimates are twice that. Private contractors would pay a third of the cost. Today, none have invested. Travel L.A. to San Francisco, under three hours. Today, no one knows how long it will take. Our goal is to give 80% of Americans access to high-speed rail. We understand what the politicians say. The reality is... Can anybody tell us what we're sacrificing this step for? Frank Oliveira's family has owned this parcel for generations, but the state is using its eminent domain authority to forcibly purchase thousands of acres of prime farmland from Oliveira and others up and down the Central Valley. Why is our livelihoods here being destroyed? for this project that will never materialize. We have over 119 miles under design and construction. Uh, we have 17 current active construction sites. But the rail project lacks secure funding. The feds kicked in $3 billion, but no more is likely. And polls show voters feel betrayed. I think it should have to go back to the voters. One, the cost overruns. They're talking now that it could be $69 billion or more. They said the private sector would invest and they have not. The state Supreme Court found ballot language used to sell the project misleading. Ridership surveys inflated, ticket prices unrealistic, and financial projections unfounded. If you're subsidizing the riders on high-speed high rail, that means you're taking money away from the classroom and from our first responders. It's the future, and it's happening right here in Fresno, California. By starting construction in the flat Central Valley, Governor Brown hoped to save money and show progress. That didn't happen. Now critics point to plans to burrow under 52 miles of mountains. Yet the cost of tunneling under just one 13-mile stretch is $7 billion, or 10% of the entire project. There's tunnels being built all over the world. Um, we're not, you know, the first country to, you know, decide that we need to build a tunnel through the mountains. Instead of a light at the end of the tunnel, the project is about to hit a budgetary brick wall. According to McCarthy, President Trump is not inclined to throw good money after bad, and the state cannot bankroll the project alone, leaving Governor Jerry Brown without a train and likely no track when he leaves office early next year. Brett? William, thank you. The massive fallout, most of it negative, from President Trump's comment about immigrants and their home countries. We'll get reaction from the panel when we come back. I cannot believe that in the history of the White House, in that Oval Office, any president has ever spoken the words that I personally heard our president speak yesterday, calling the nations they come from holes. The exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. I think there's definitely been selective leaks. There's been inaccurate reporting on this. I was not in that meeting, but what I can tell you is that he made it very clear that the, that language was not, the language was not used, and it's very clear that this is the Democrats trying to derail this process. Yeah, I, I read those comments later last night. Uh, so first thing that came to my mind was very unfortunate, um, unhelpful.
Well, it was the meeting with uh, comments specifically heard around the world. Uh, the president kind of trying to step back from this uh, on Twitter this morning. The language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made, a big setback for DACA. Never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Never said take them out. Made up by Dems, I have a wonder, wonderful relationship with Haitians, probably should record future meetings, unfortunately no trust. However, um, despite the fact that two Republican senators came out and said they didn't remember hearing it, uh, another Republican senator there, uh, Lindsey Graham, told a colleague he did hear exactly that. Um, and then you just heard about uh, Dick Durbin. Well, Rush Limbaugh, talking about all the media, uh, said that today on his radio show, it amounts to moral preening from a drive-by media eager to project their phony supremacy onto the American people. Quote, they offend me far more than Donald Trump does. These people in the media are a bunch of the biggest phony balonies on the planet acting like they don't talk this way. They think this way about Mississippi. They think this way about the American South. They think this way about flyover country. I can't stand this phony phony supremacy and superiority that these people projected as though anybody who does think or talk that way is somehow subhuman, a reprobate, or other things. With that, let's bring in our panel. Jonathan Swan, national political reporter for Axios. Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief at USA Today. And Byron York, Chief Political Correspondent of the Washington Examiner. Okay, uh, it just from our talking to people in and around at different sources, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of doubt uh, that this all, this conversation happened. Right. It's what the context was and what he was talking about on uh, immigration, specifically merit-based immigration. It's also not surprising to people who spend a lot of time with the president because it's how he feels. He, this is how he's always felt about this issue. Uh, and in fact, you often read about the sort of palace intrigue of the immigration discussions, you know, which staff is on which side. It actually doesn't matter a whole lot with immigration and trade because the president has these very uh, hardwired, instinctive beliefs. And, and that comment was perfectly in keeping with what he says privately, you know, repeatedly to people um, about these countries. Susan. But it uh, just because he speaks about that privately doesn't make it less offensive in terms of of language. And it's I think it's had this created this global uh, firestorm because it crystallizes existing concerns about his his attitudes on race. Byron. Uh, well, I think now we want to figure out how what effect this will have on these DACA negotiations. The president had already rejected this idea from the sort of self-appointed bipartisan group of six senators who said they were close to a DACA deal, uh, said wasn't enough on the wall, said they were completely wrong on chain migration, said their idea on the visa lottery wouldn't work. I mean, the president had rejected that. As a matter of fact, I, I think his outburst in the Oval Office came as a result of them pitching this idea on the visa lottery, which he found completely uh, unacceptable. So I, I think that, that Mercedes Schlapp was correct when she says the Democrats are trying to, to completely undermine uh, this. Uh, we'll see what effect it has. Well, speaking of... Uh uh, the long list of people who are saying this was a racist comment, uh, here are a couple of them. It was uh, racist, it was inappropriate, it was crude and loathsome. There are not enough adjectives really to describe how inappropriate the president's remarks were. Do you think he's a racist? His, 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 his every sign is that he, he speaks like a racist. He, he, he conjures up those fears, but uh, categorizing him by a name does not quite address the issue. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, releasing a statement following comments by the president. I said my piece directly to him yesterday. The president and all those attending the meeting know what I said and how I feel. This comes as he, the president, recognized Martin Luther King today in the ceremony, signing a proclamation, and, um, and then faced some questions yelled uh, by reporters in the room. Yes, and it was sort of unfortunate uh, timing. Uh, he was actually filming that Martin Luther K, uh, King address while this uh, was breaking, the news was breaking that he described these countries um, this way. Uh, one thing we know for sure after yesterday 
is that this immigration issue and DACA will not be solved by the so-called Gang of Six. And I think that one thing we've also learned is that Lindsey Graham uh, miscalculated with the president. He has been flattering the president to no end, playing golf with him, complimenting him on his golf courses and his golf game, and really buttering him up. And people have been speculating as to why that might be. Uh, one of the policy issues he wants to bend him on is immigration. And this deal is just dead on arrival. And the people who, are, who pitched it I do not believe will be the people who will take the final deal across the line. Right, because it, w this meeting happened in the Oval Office. This bipartisan group, which is a fairly narrow group, um, said they had a deal. And then they walk in to find other senators, like Senator Cotton and uh, Representative Goodlatte from the House, who said this is not a deal. So there's a reason why year after year after year we've continued to not have a deal despite negotiations with various groups including some of the people who are in on this uh, Senate group. I, I I frankly am flummoxed by thinking about how they get a deal. Uh, certainly by how they get a deal by next Thursday or Friday when they have to ex do s pass government funding or, or see happening. the government yeah. shut down. <laughs> it's got to so, be a continuing resolution yeah. again, right? The fourth time. But will everybody go for that? I mean, I think there are some forces that are against that idea. Idea too. But I, Democrats are trying to create a sense of urgency here, as if the DACA deal has to somehow be done by next Friday for the funding the government deal. It does not. The DACA deal, uh, uh, the Trump's announcement would expire on March the 5th. Well, it does if Democrats say that that's the lever point that <laughs> yeah. they make the deal. They had that opportunity in December and did not do it, and Republicans' leadership down do not believe they're going to try to shut down the government for Let me that just read one time. thing from a senior administration official about the conversation. Uh, and this is where the comment happens about merit-based immigration. Many nations, especially Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, the list goes on, utilize merit-based. Why in the modern era should the U.S. take immigrants unskilled and unlikely to quickly, quickly integrate from questionable countries that have severe human rights issues, dysfunctional government, and failed economies? Why can't the U.S. look out for itself and its future that we should bring in immigrants, 1.1 million annually is the steady state, that we that we need to require they speak English, they have usable skill for modern economy, will contribute and integrate and will not go on welfare of any kind. Um, that is what they're trying to pitch. Well, I don't know if your source is Stephen Miller, but that is a pretty good distillation of how he thinks about this and, and how the president thinks about this. This is probably the core of, uh, of their immigration worldview, which is that people should be judged in a different way uh, and, and that the immigration system should be overhauled around this idea of quote unquote merit. Which would not have created a problem if Trump had simply read that statement. Well, that's what I mean. He said that instead exactly. of. That sounds pretty yeah. rational, but As he has undercut his own argument by by creating instead this controversy over the offensive language he used. Okay, quickly, before we go to the lightning round, the president's physical exam today at Walter Reed National Medical Military Medical Center, according to his doctor, went, quote, exceptionally well. The president is in excellent health, and I look forward to briefing some of the details on Tuesday, Dr. Ronnie Jackson from Walter Reed. Next up, the Friday lightning round, the Iran nuclear deal, winners and losers. is still in the Iran deal. The president deciding today, despite my strong inclination, I have not yet withdrawn the U.S. from the Iran nuclear deal, basically saying this is the last chance. We're back with the panel. Lightning round. Jonathan. Uh, well, uh, Iran. on Iran, um, the, the, the big thing that they said today was that they're going to leave it to Congress and the Europeans to fix this. If anyone thinks that the Europeans are going to follow the Trump administration's lead and, and make this a tougher deal, I don't know what they're smoking. Or what about the to-do to list with Congress? I mean, just to add it to the long list of things. Well, the congressional thing's interesting because you have a fight essentially now in Washington between the people who are really tough on Iran, the hawks who like the House bill, uh, the Roskam bill, and they think that the Corker bill in the Senate is very weak, whereas a lot of people in the Senate say this is the only thing we can get done. So there's going to be a big policy fight. All um, right, there uh, in Congress. So the economy. We have economic changes since January 2017. GDP growth, unemployment rate, consumer confidence, and then you look at the milestones in the market, including today, three other record closes. Uh, 150 plus companies putting $3 billion in cash payouts to employees. 
So apparently the market does not care about vulgar comments about immigrant, immigrants in a White House meeting. That's clear from today's, uh, today's record setting. You know, this is a fantastic safety net for the administration because we know that if when Americans feel like their own lives are going well, they are willing to forgive a lot in their leaders. All right, winners and losers. Winner first. My winner is uh, Tua Tugavaloa. One year ago, he was in high school, and now he has quarterbacked the University of Alabama to a national championship and helped Nick Saban tie Bear Bryant's record, so that's huge. As a real freshman. As a honest-to-goodness freshman. Uh, loser is Google. Uh, details in a new lawsuit show that working at Google can be a nightmare of political correctness, so they are a loser even if they become a trillion-dollar company. All right, Susan, winner and loser. Well, my winner is Dick Durbin because he went to the White House to have a, what we assume was going to be a serious conversation about an immigra bipartisan immigration deal. And he came out and spoke up about the president's language. And what is striking to me is that when, he, when the president said, I didn't use those words, and Dick Durbin said, yes, he did, basically all of Washington believed Dick Durbin, not the president. I think that's pretty remarkable. Right. Let me just ask you, don't you think it's Dick Durbin who put out that that was what was used? I, th I think he, he maybe he he, 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 he's the obvious, okay, he's the obvious source, but he's not the only person in that meeting who might have put that out. All I right, loser. Yeah. I, my, my loser is, is, is President Trump because he had just managed with that interesting meeting on Tuesday that televised negotiating said to put aside some of the, some of the perceptions of fire and fury and then he comes right back around him through his own actions, gets himself again in just a, a, a load of trouble. By the way, that was this week. <laughs> All right, winner and then loser. Jonathan. Uh, winner, Florida Governor Rick Scott, who somehow, I don't know how, but managed to make Florida the only one of these states that didn't have the offshore drilling. I don't know why. And, and we hear he might run for the Senate in Florida. Um, and the loser, I think Lindsey 